Good afternoon and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and in Jury Foundation are so excited to be with you here to kick off another exciting semester of live webinars events. In this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science and explore what's happening in the field. We also talk about interesting careers related to marine science and more. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Dan Danielle Engel, a postdoctoral research associate with the Ecomorph Lab and the Gulf Center for Sea Turtle Research at Texas A&M University at Galveston about wonderfully weird evolution of manatee skeletons. She's going to give us a closer look into how manatee bones provide clues about their aquatic lives. But first, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our programs. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program that's housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The mission of CEFs is to engage K-12 Florida students and teachers in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences like today that hopefully inspire future stewards of our planet. Injury Foundation, sorry about that. Injury Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. And many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65 foot research vessel, the RV Injury. And in case you missed it, at the beginning of the presentation today, we'd like to remind you that you can submit questions for the scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll be sure to uh, get to those shortly. We also will provide a survey at the end of today's presentation for a chance to get yourself some really cool swag. So be sure to take part. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Danielle Engel. She's going to tell us a little bit about herself, about her work and why it's so important. So Dr. Engel, I'm going to go ahead and stop share to let you take things over from here. Hi, everybody. It's so awesome to be here today. Oh, let me get it to the beginning. Um, yeah, I want to thank um, Anjari Foundation and scientists in every Florida school for having me. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the wonderfully weird uh, manatees and their skeletons and what we can learn from them. So like any good story, I want to start at the beginning. Um, so my first fascination with skeletons was when I was about eight years old. I walked into the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and in the foyer, I saw this 60-foot fin whale. And I didn't know it at the time, but I started developing some research questions like, how does this animal move in its environment? How um, does the shape impact its behavioral ecology? and just its overall life history. And so that seed was planted a while ago and I had the opportunity to pursue um, my PhD at Florida Atlantic University. And I studied a, a ton of megafauna. So I got to study the cartilaginous skeletons of sharks. Um, I looked at the um, form and function of bone in dolphins and whales. And of course, I looked at some manatee bones. I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at Texas A&M University at Galveston. And uh, my research focus in this position is the feeding ecology and mechanics of sea turtles. And so I'm doing some fun projects um, there as well. I'm um, kind of a side project is I'm putting together a sea turtle skeleton with some volunteers. And I did the same at Florida Atlantic University with a dolphin. So that's kind of like, I like to build a skeleton at every place I work pretty much. And um, I have, have participated in some sea turtle release because we have a, a hospital on campus for sea turtles. So, um, but today we're gonna focus on manatees. So manatees can be found um, and their relatives can be found all over the world. So the group of manatees and their relatives are called Serenia. And so what we're most familiar with or those that are tuning in from Florida are the West Indian manatee. And the Florida manatee is a subspecies of them. Okay, then we also have the West African manatee and the Amazonian manatee, which are the smallest of the, of the manatees. We also have the dugong, which is over in the Indo-Pacific. And um, these make up our, our manatees and relatives that are alive today. 
1741, uh, we discovered a large dugong, dugong essentially called a stellar sea cow. And that was a 30 foot long animal. Um, and it went extinct in 1768. So it's a poster child of uh, poor conservation management. It was overhunted. But it, it seemed like a very fascinating animal. Um, so all of manatees and their relatives are, um, are considered vulnerable by the IUCN Red List. But manatees did not always look that the way they look today which is a um, elongated body with um, front flippers and a big paddle-shaped paddle tail. Um, their ancestors actually walked on land and lived on land. So over 50 million years ago, we had Parastomus and it was semi-aquatic. So it lived on land, but it would kind of start foraging in the aquatic environment. So um, they are herbivores, they're plant eaters. And then about 30 million years ago is when we started seeing the body plan of manatees today. Okay, so um, the two front flippers and either the lunate shaped or paddle shaped tail. So how did these animals transition from a four-legged body plan to a, an aquatic swimmer? Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through how that happened or the, the uh, predominant hypotheses of how that happened. So up here, I have um, your, your old um, ancestor manatee that still had four legs, kind of a corgi body plan looking thing here. Um, and so in this diagram, you see the upward arrow has a B that's buoyant force, and the downward arrow has a G that's gravitational force. So you can see how the two are not lined up and that creates a tilt in the animal. And so the head is kind of um, up above the water. If you've seen a dog swimming in, in water, it would look like that. And then after some million years passed and natural selection and mutations occurred, we have an animal whose um, who's body is elongating. Um, the front limbs are turning into more flipper-like appendages and the tail is broadening out into either a lunate or paddle shaped tail. The hind legs are starting to get smaller. Okay, and so with all these changes, we're getting a more, um, more aligned buoyant and gravitational force. So the animal is getting a little bit more horizontally trim in the water column. And um, so they're starting to move forward in the water, move around through a combination of paddling of their, their back legs but also um, propulsion of their fluke or their tail. And then finally, we have the manatees that we see today. They're completely horizontally trim in the water column and their buoyant, um, the buoyant and gravitational forces are aligned. So this helps them um, achieve that. And all of their propulsion is occurring at their, their large tails. So if we look into the skeletons and how um, they differ between this very ancient manatee ancestor and manatees we see today, um, we can see some similarities, but of course many differences. So on the left here, we have a piezosiren um, ancestor and um, we have Daryl Domning here, who's, um, who's an awesome paleontologist and, and anatomist for manatees and their relatives. And so we can see the, the four legs here. Um, we can see like the ribs are pretty thick, okay? But if we look over at the Florida manatee, we can see that of course the hind legs are gone, but the ribs are a lot thicker, even compared to these already thick ribs in the piezo siren. And this is covering um, really large lungs that are in the Serenia. So the lungs can um, be as long as a third of the animal's body, body length. So if we take a rib and we section it, this is what you'll see in a piezosiren fossil rib versus a manatee rib. So um, normally a bone, like if you were take, to take a human bone, there would be a lot of porosity in the center, um, but you can see that the, the bone is almost completely dense throughout, especially in the manatee. 
Um, and so this is what's called um, osteosclerosis or densification. But on top of it, the manatee has um, swollen ribs. So this is called pachyostosis. And um, so we can see here that the bones are um, functioning in buoyancy control uh, because they are um, providing weight to counteract the, the inflated large lungs of these animals so that they're able to position themselves in the water column. But not all bone is um, specifically to regulate buoyancy control. And that brings me to my, oh, and this is a dugong. So a dugong is going to be kind of in the middle of the pisosiren and the manatee. So that brings me to my research interest, which is um, how can we um, determine some, some information about the manatees based on parts of their skeleton? And the vertebrae or um, the bones that make up their back are porous, they're not completely dense throughout like the ribs. And this um, spongy bone will actually change um, based on loads that they that are um, imparted on the tissue itself. So I have a video clip of, it's not a manatee vertebra, but it's some of the other um, specimens that I researched during my PhD, a pygmy sperm whale. So I just wanna show you the, the very intricate architecture that can be within the vertebrae. So some bone 101, um, Wolf's Law states that the bony structure or, or architecture will adapt in response to load direction and, man, uh, and magnitude. So in other words, form will follow function, okay? There's a direct connection between the two. So if you look at this cross section of a human um, thigh bone or femur, you can see that the spongy bone is oriented in some spe specific directions. So we have um, at the head of the femur, some struts of spongy bone that are oriented to resist compressive forces because that our body weight, we carry our body weight on our um, femoral heads, right? And there are some ligaments that pull the, the thigh bone in towards the midline of the body. And so those struts are resisting tensile forces. So we can see a clear connection between you know, our daily habitual life and um, what the bone will show us. So could the properties of manatee bone hold clues to their biology and their life history? So manatees are pretty cool in that they're, first of all, they're a mammal, they're an air-breathing mammal that um, transition back to life in water. So they, they're living in water and they'll submerge in water, but they have to come up to breathe and they have to do so every few minutes. Um, so what does that mean for manatees when they're born? Um, so the baby manatees have to be what we call um, precocial. And that means that they have to be um, very um, independent with their locomotion, um, very like immediately, because they have to surface to breathe. And so I have up here a growth curve of a manatee. We have body length on the y-axis and years on the x-axis. And I've divided up this growth curve into life stages of this animal. So perinatal is just a newborn. And we have the calf, sub-adult, and adult. And you can see that the animal almost doubles in size um, by the time they're a an older calf. So they're growing extremely rapidly. And then once they re reach the later subadult um, sub stage, they're kind of plateauing in their, in their growth. Another thing is that manatees have a pretty cool swimming style. They're, of course, are using the axis of their body. Um, so their ancestors use appendicular locomotion or, or limb locomotion but these animals are using axial locomotion and it's called undulation. So they are, let me loop it again. So they're throwing their body into this wave that travels to the length, um, the length of their body with the forces being transmitted to their tail. So how could these um, components of manatee life history show up in their bone? So to study this, I um, partnered with Florida Fish and Wildlife, and um, I, they invited me into their necropsies, 
What a necropsy is, is an animal autopsy. So these manatees were either hit by boats or died of natural causes. Um, so they, this was a po post-mortem um, investigation, of course. And um, I sampled vertebrae from 20 manatees from different developmental stages the, through perinatal to adult. And um, I selected vertebrae from different parts of the, the vertebral column because I wanted to see if there's gonna be a difference along the spine um, based on, you know, that would reflect their locomotion. So what I did is I took these vertebrae and I cut them with a bandsaw. And um, so I cut out a, a slice from the very center of the vertebra. And I cut little cubes out from that vertebra. And um, so what I did is I tested them in, in compression on a material testing machine. Okay. And so I ran over 700 tests <laughs> during my PhD. And um, so I got to, I got a lot of information from that. So I want to walk you through what the output looks like for a material test. So we have the plate pushing down on the bone. Okay. And so the, we get a reading of force that's being pushed down and displacement is the amount of change that occurs based on the, the force and the pressing of the plate. And so we have this, um, this curve here. So we're having displacement and a climbing force. And then the material right here um, at this point where it kind of curves over, um, the material is now permanently deformed. It's compromised and won't return to normal even when the force is removed. So from, um, I turn this into a stress strain curve based on the area of the cube. So I can standardize um, all the tests. And I calculated yield strength, which is permanent, um, the ability to withstand permanent deformation and stiffness, which is material rigidity. So for the purposes of time, I'm going to focus more on yield strength, but I'll rope in stiffness um, at the end of the talk. Okay, so for some data, I um, compared the different values I got based on developmental stage in different regions of the vertebral column. And so on the y-axis here, we have yield strength, which is measured in megapascals. And we have the different developmental stages on the x-axis and the different regions of the vertebral column. And so for these data, you can see that the colors match up with where in the, in the spine they are. And um, so the, the top whisker of these, these data are the maximum values and the bottom whisker are the minimum values. And the center bar is the average. So as you may expect, I found that um, bone was strongest in the subadult and the adult manatees, kind of at that place where growth plateaus. Um, it was intermediately strong in the calves and the least strong in the perinatals. But when I looked at how the values differed within each animal or within the developmental stage, um, based on placement of the vertebral column, I found some pretty interesting things. I found that in the calf and subadult only, bone located closer to the tail was stronger than bone more anterior in the body. And I found this pretty interesting because, you know, this animal is growing so fast and it's having to um, use this axial propulsion right away. And that's a lot of force that's imparted on the bone. And that force is traveling towards the tail. So maybe in this very critical, um, rapid um, stage of growth and development, the bone, it has to be stronger in that location to withstand those forces. And so here's a reminder of where, you know, when they're the growth curve kind of plateaus. So I want to bring in um, some information, not only about the manatee, but um, their, their counterpart aquatic mammals, which are cetaceans or whales and dolphins and their relatives, and look at what is the relationship between bone strength and stiffness. Now remember, strength is the um, ability to withstand deformation, and stiffness is the material rigidity. Okay, so when I compared um, whales and manatees, I found that 
um, the relationships between strength and stiffness were about the same. This was pretty cool because um, even though they, whales and dolphins kind of look like manatees and vice versa, they're not that closely, re closely related. It's something that we call convergent evolution. Um, so I thought it was pretty neat to, to have such a similarity here. And then I'm like, okay, so maybe the similarities are based on their aquatic habitat and their, um, the way they swim and, and how they live, right, in their aquatic environments. So how will um, animals that live on, or specifically mammals that live on land compare? So I looked at data from, um, from other, other sources, previously published data on a cow and human, and I found very different relationships here. So for every given strength, um, land mammal bone was a lot stiffer, so a lot more rigid. And so what I think is going on here is that, that in water, you're supported by buoyant forces, right? You're not, you don't have appendicular locomotion. Um, you're not having to bear your body weight. Um, and so I think us, unfortunately on land, we have to, <laughs> we have to really um, withstand these gravitational forces and that bone rigidity may be more important. So in the future, I would like to do something that's called micro, um, micro computed tomography scanning, which is basically producing a 3D, 3D x-ray of manatee bones. So what I can do with those scans is look at the structure and the architecture of those bones and then connect it back with the data I collected on their bone properties like strength and stiffness. And what I can do with that is uh, go back into the fossil record because I can't take a fossil and do a compression test, for example. Um, I have to extrapolate the function based on the architecture. I can also micro CT scan um, some fossil bone. And um, so maybe we'll get a, a better insight into the transition of locomotion and life history um, from over 50 million years ago to what we see today with these with these manatees. And I love this picture because I wanted to throw this picture up because um, it's a picture of a um, duodon, which is an ancient whale. And um, if you notice towards the back, we have these really tiny little legs. Okay. And so if you were to just look at this animal, you may think, oh, maybe it kind of walked on land, you know, it has legs, but it did not because there's no connection with the vertebral column here. Uh, and so this is a reminder that if we just look at whole bone morphology, um, we can um, get a bit confused in, in function and, and, um, and gaining information on, on that animal that existed millions and millions of years ago. So that's my argument for looking at bone at a material level at, a, at the tissue level. So I would like to thank everyone who funded my work. This was a, a six year PhD and, and was very labor intensive. And, um, and so I have a lot of people to acknowledge, but here's some of, of the funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Dr. Engel, thank you so much for uh, sharing your work with us today. So we're now going to begin our Q&A portion of today's Ocean Expert Exchange. And if anyone tuning in has any questions, please type them into the chat box now, and I will be happy to ask them for you. So our first question today from a elementary school student, what is the average weight of an adult manatee? That's a great question. On average, manatees are about a thousand pounds, but the heaviest recorded manatee was 3,500 pounds. Wow. Really big, but not, not normal by any means. <laughs> well, our next question, Valentine would like to know just how big a manatee can get. And I think you sort of touched on that a little bit, but also what are the records for length, girth? Yeah, so um, length, I, so on average, they're about nine to 10, um, 10 feet. I think the longest was around 13, but no longer than that. And they're very rotund. I don't know the, the like circumference of their, their belly, but they're so big. And a lot of that has to do with their um, huge ribs. They actually are not very fat. 
they look like they would be, but they just have a lot of muscle and really big bones. Oh, good. Makes a lot of sense. So another elementary school student would like to know how many years can a manatee live? Manatees are pretty long lived. So um, the record of the long lived manatee is currently 69 years. And that was a manatee that was in captivity in Florida. And um, so they can be very long lived. In the wild, their lifespan is more about 30 years to 40 years, just because they, they have, um, they face some threats that are mostly human related. And another student would like to know if you could just tell us a little bit more about the locations where manatees like to live. For instance, are there particular water conditions they prefer or fresh versus salt? Great question. Um, manatees are what we call urihaline. So that means that they can transition from fresh water all the way to the saltiest of waters and everything in between. Um, so with that flexibility, you'll find manatees pretty much everywhere. If you're like, let's just use Florida as an example. You'll find them along the coast. You'll find them in um, freshwater springs. You'll find them in canals. Um, so they're pretty, they are definitely flexible with where you can, where they can go. And there's a manatee that lives in the Amazon ri River, the Amazonian manatee. That's the smallest of the manatees. Well, and kind of with going along on that route, how deep in the ocean can a manatee swim? They don't really like water that's more than about eight to 10 feet deep. Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, where their food is. So sea grasses are typically in, um, on, the, on the ocean floor where it's like about eight, six to eight feet deep. And um, so the mantis are kind of hanging out there, but they're not really excellent divers. They're, what they're really good at is just like staying horizontal and moving in the water column um, in, in that pretty um, short depth range. Uh, it's kind of like um, their rib and lung combination is similar to how a, um, a scuba diving setup works. So you have your, your weight belt, anyone who's scuba dives, you have a, a weight belt attached to you and you have your buoyancy control device and you can kind of control like how much air is in that and you can, you know, regulate where you are in the water. So manatees are doing that, but with their lungs, right? And then their ribs are their weight belt. That's a great analogy. So another student wonders, how much food can a manatee eat in a day on average? That is a great question. Um, I don't know the exact um, like pounds of, of vegetation that they'll eat. Um, I think it's, it's definitely above 50 that they can eat, um, but that's a really good question. But they're very, they have slow metabolism. So they'll, it'll take them um, anywhere from a few days to a kind of a week to digest what they're eating. So very, very slow. Okay. Uh, Ryan asks, if you've done any test past the yield point for the stress strain relationship, does fracture occur immediately or after this point? Great question. So that, um, maybe I will pull that. Yes. The stress strain curve up. So yes, this is yield, right? And fracture and these spongy bone cubes that I was testing actually didn't really occur. It can absorb so much energy or the spongy bone can absorb so much energy that it just kind of eventually flattens. Um, other bone that you would see fracture like that, um, destructive testing is in cortical bone or hard bone. So that's the bone that is like on the outside. If you take like our, like the image of the, the human femur that I had up, that's the bone on the outside that's completely dense throughout. Um, so I, I was surprised by that in my test. It was just very, um, it was indicative of like how the, this behavior of the bone, how strong it really was but it wasn't very stiff. Okay. Um, an elementary student is wondering about the smallest manatee ever documented, perhaps even when they were born. Um, manatees, when they're born, they're about 60 pounds and they'll be from anywhere from three to four feet long. 
And so they, they're pretty, pretty small and, and they grow, they like double and triple in that size, like pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> Lydia wonders if manatees have any vestigial bones similar to whales that show their history of walking on land. They do, great question. There, let me see if I can see it on the, uh, I don't know if you can really see it, but they do. So they have vestigial pelvises, okay? And so it's just a, a, a bone about this long, right? A few inches long. And that's all that's left of their pelvis. And um, so that is, that's similar to, you're completely right to whales and dolphins dolphins and their relatives. And so that's another really fascinating example of convergent evolution. Uh, can you share any information about the current size of the manatee population? In Florida, there are, um, I think the, the latest data shows that there's about 7,500 manatees. And um, so we're uh, even just four years ago, manatees were considered endangered, and now they're considered vulnerable. So the population had, in, um, the, the numbers had kind of bounced back. And, um, but I don't know about other manatee populations. Um, there's actually not a lot of data on it. We need to, to get people out there and to do population surveys. Um, I, I think in, um, the Amazonian manatee had uh, over like 9,000, but there was a survey done in like the late 1970s. And, um, but that the population has been on the decline, unfortunately, since then that we know. So we don't know where those numbers are today. Okay, all right. Well, as a follow-up, Lydia's students would like to know if manatees have any natural predators. Good question. Um, for the Florida manatees, they don't. Their, their predator is human, um, just humans, human watercraft, um, human, you know, pollution. And so, so we are their, their predator really um, without predating on them. <laughs> We're their, the, the source of danger for them. Um, if manatees, if they're really small, they can, there can be um, sometimes a shark predation. It's not very common. Um, and that may, you know, in, in Africa, there, there are larger predators, for example, we just don't know a lot of information on the, the predator prey dynamic there. Okay. Great question. Uh, Jay asks if seagrasses are calcium rich or if mantis get their bone building min minerals from other sources. Um, that is a really good question. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I look forward to looking it up. I think we all do. Um, <laughs> uh, July asks, why dugongs and manatees evolve to have different tails? Uh, yeah, so, okay, I love this. I love this topic. Um, I think of a dugong kind of like a, a whale or dolphin that, or, or a manatee that's trying to be a whale or dolphin because dugongs are a lot thinner. They're a lot faster than manatees. Um, they live in some deeper water like you'd find in whales and dolphins. And so I think that that lunate shaped tail is um, a more efficient propulsor really. So um, they're able to, um, they're able to propulse, um, it, um, the, the lift generated by that tail is uh, more efficient for their swimming. Um, and so why the manatees have the paddle shaped tail, that's a really good question. Um, it's kind of more clear why the lunate shaped tail would, would evolve in these faster dugongs, um, just kind of like their, their dolphin counterparts. So we have to do more research on that. More research is always needed. Yes. Um, Heather wonders how many types of manatees are there and how big do these other species get? There are currently three species of manatee. So we have our West Indian manatee, we have the African manatee, and we have the Amazonian manatee. And how big they each get? The West Indian manatee is the largest of the three. 
it the African manatee looks a lot like the West Indian, but is a little bit smaller. Okay, but it's really hard to tell them apart. And the smallest of the three is the Amazonian manatee. And you can also tell the difference between the Amazonian manatees and the other species based on the coloration. So they have the darkest skin color, except for their belly, which is splotches of white and a very light pink. Okay. Um, Brenda asks if any of these species migrate. Yes, good question. Um, so the Florida manatee, let's use them as an example. They are our um, state snowbirds or one of them. They're the mammal form of snowbirds. So um, as soon as the, they'll, um, during the summer months between like kind of May or April, May up through October, they will swim up north. They'll, they'll swim up to, um, on, off of the East Coast, they'll swim up to Virginia. Um, manatees have even been found as far north as kind of Cape Cod area during those months. Uh, but as soon as November starts rolling around, they have to get back down to um, Florida waters or in that general region um, because they are really bad at what's called thermoregulating or uh, maintaining their body heat. So they can't be in waters under 68 degrees Celsius, um, Fahrenheit, excuse me, um, or else they'll, they'll start getting really sick. They'll get um, this condition that we call cold stun. They'll kind of stop moving. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. And that happens sometimes. Sometimes manatees won't make it um, back to their, what we call refuges in time. And that's why we have really great organizations like FWC who will respond to these manatees that are stuck in a bad situation. And sometimes even in Florida, they'll experience this, this cold stress. If we have a really, um, if we have a very sudden drop in temperature, that's when we see them near the power plants. That's when they come to the power plants. Yep, I used to work at Manatee Lagoon, so we um, we had some days just tons of manatees just um, just aggregating around the the warm water that is a product of those those plants. Uh, Jackie would like to know why manatees have fingernails on their flippers. Oh, very good question. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? They um, so that is an ancestral trait. So um, something that helps me think about it this way is their, their closest relative that's alive today or one of them is the elephant. So if you think of an elephant foot and the big fingernails, then you can kind of be like, oh, okay, I see the, the similarity. I can see the, the relation, right? <laughs> the family, the family relation, but um, I don't know why they didn't lose the fingernails. Um, they kind of grab at their their food when they're feeding. They'll kind of kind of pull at their grasses and go like this. And I'm like, I I don't know, but I it's possible that that's helping um, helping them resist the wear and the kind of the scratching on their their flippers, right? Because other animals with flippers don't do that as much. I mean, if you think of if you think of um, dolphins and whales, they have very stiff flippers. So they're not really using that to eat a lot of the time or like digging up at their, at their food. Interesting. Really good question. <laughs> um, all right, just a couple more questions now. Um, does color and size variation in the different species have to do with the climates in which they live? Great question. Um, well, that's possible, and I think to some degree. So if we look back to the, the stellar sea cow up here, right, this guy. So this guy was living in the north in really cold water. So you can see um, this bright yellow. That's where that animal lived. And um, this was the biggest animal. So it was um, about 30 feet long. It had, um, it had very thick skin. Okay, it had it had more more fat than you'd um, than you'd find in our in our you know to manatees today and dugongs today. So yeah, size may be driven by the the climates that they live. Okay, Good question. 
Yeah, and our final question uh, for this Ocean Expert Exchange, Carrie wants to know, what's the coolest skeleton you've studied? The coolest skeleton, wow. Um, whew, that's hard. I feel like I'm so attached to each one, <laughs> each kind, but I'd say, I mean, sharks and their relatives, they have cartilaginous skeletons. So they have mineral deposits within the cartilage and that makes up their skeleton. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I did a study um, doing, uh, assessing the material properties of shark vertebrae. Um, and that was, that was pretty cool. Just so different. That's awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and we've learned so much from you. So thank you so much for your time. And we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. I'm now going to turn it over to Stephanie to wrap up today's talk. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Angela. And thank you so much, Dr. Engel, for sharing such fascinating information about manatees with us today. Um, your research is truly phenomenal. Uh, we'd like to make sure that those of you who are K-12 classrooms to please check out the extension activities and resources that we've compiled that are related to today's talk. You can find those along with a recording of today's event on the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. Please take a moment to complete the survey link that you see here on your screen. And I believe my colleagues are placing that in the chat box. You should be able to clink, uh, click directly to that link and help us uh, know what we are doing right, hopefully a lot. That was very exciting. So upcoming events for spring are on the way soon. Be sure to check out Anjari Foundation and the Scientist in Every Photo School event calendars for more information soon on spring events. You can learn more about the Scientists in Every Florida School and Injury Foundation by visiting our websites and following us on social media. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation and we wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.